let's get into part four of relationship rehab. And uh, what we've been saying is that God is, God has a way of doing relationships. And our scripture or our founding scripture is found in Matthew chapter 7. And what it says is that there was a man that built his house on the sand. He says, if you listen to my words, Jesus speaking, he says, if you listen to my words, but you don't apply them, he goes, you're like the man that built his house on the sand. The winds came, the, the floods came, and the house collapsed. But if you listen to my words and you apply them, he's like, you're like the man that built his house upon the rock. And what we said as a church community is that we are going to decide to build our relationship on the rock. Does anybody believe that in this house? If you believe that in the comments section, say, I am going to build my relationship on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Today, I want to talk about resolving conflict. Ooh, it's going to be good. Look at the person next to you. Oh, I haven't been able to say that. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person six feet away from you. Tell them. Resolving conflict. And our key verse for today is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20 through 27. It says, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be, notice it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness therefore putting away lying let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another and verse 26 is really what I want to hone in on today it says be angry all the people that got anger issues of that favorite verse. Hallelujah. <laughs> Be angry. Look what it says. It says, and do not sin. Another translation says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. I don't know about you, but I have felt moments in my life where there was a point where it felt like I wasn't controlling me anymore. It says you can be angry, but don't let the anger control you. It says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And verse 27, which I think is key, it says, nor give place to the devil. I want to preach to you on this title, Resolving Before Dissolving. Resolving Before Dissolving. I think so many relationships are dissolving and they're breaking up and they're not making it because they have not yet learned how to resolve God has entrusted them with, which is their relationship. Resolving before dissolving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these moments that we have together. Lord, we pray that you speak to your community, to your church. Speak to every heart that's listening right now, Lord Jesus. Transform our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody says, Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise where we are in the chat room. In the, we got a live studio audience in the building. I don't know if you can hear them, but I hope. Can we, can we just make some noise? Let, the, let them hear you. Live studio audience. So we're going to get some feedback here. Have you ever been in a silly fight? Silly fight. You, you ain't never been in a good, committed relationship if you've never been in a silly fight that escalated quickly. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you uh, use the toilet paper, but don't replace it once it gets to the carpool, the cardboard roll. You know what I'm sorry, talking about? Like, why didn't you just replace it? Well, I just, you know, I did my business. Don't be telling me what to do in the bathroom, okay? Uh, what about, what about whose turn it is to use the charger? That ever happened to you? Like you ever got into one of those silly fights? Yeah, but I'm at 40%. I know, but I'm at 10%. Well, it's my charger. I don't, I'm at 40% and the reason I, I brought my job, yeah, but I'm at 5% right now and I need juice. What about the infamous petty fight? This has destroyed relationships all over the world. Why did you like her picture on Instagram? 
Lisa and I have been dealing with a petty, petty argument, petty fight, and I'm going to be honest, I'm done. All right? I've had it. I'm going to be honest, I'm done. Why? Because Lisa's body temperature is the temperature of hell. Lisa is hot 24-7, and I'm freezing cold all the time. And so her and I, I'm, I'm telling you, the summer comes, 80 degrees, I'm already preparing the fight. And this year, this year I, I was done. I'm fed up. This year, I'm done. I'm like, listen, it's me or the fan. Pick one. Because the problem is that the summer starts inching its way here. And what happens is that Lisa gets this diabolical, demon-possessed, sacrilegious fan and places it as an idol within my bedroom it's idol worship to me I'm just saying that's what it looks like to me she brings the fan she brings it and I'm just like listen listen hold on a second hold on a second listen listen it's not summer yet yeah but it's 80 degrees yeah but it's not summer yet and we agreed two years ago that we were gonna only bring it in the summer okay and no but it's fan season she'll, she'll like mock me you know what I mean like you ever been mocked it's fan season fan season I'm like no, I'm done. Honey, I'm, I'm done. Because here, here, here's what happens. I'm going to be honest. Like, I'll go to sleep looking like an Eskimo. I got thermals. I got sweats. I got sweaters. I got hoodies. And this is without the fan. With the fan. It's like, I'm done with this. Honey, I am done. We have literally, that, that nine years we've been fighting every summer over this fan. Okay, and she's like, but baby, you don't understand that I'm super hot. And you don't understand, if I go to sleep without the fan, I wake up sweating. And I'm like, well, then use another blanket. And she's like, it doesn't matter. She's like, why don't you put on more clothes? I'm like, I look like an Eskimo. I look like an Eskimo. Like, what, what, what? No, I'm done. And she's like, baby, you don't understand. My body temperature is hot, and I need the fan. And I'm like, use another blanket. She's like, that doesn't matter. You have to understand, people that are hot are hot. And people that's body temperature, they're hot. Why don't you just ask Marcus our drum? And I'm like, first of all, don't be bringing up another man's name in the middle of our conversation. Needless to say, needless to say, we are resolving that conflict ever so slowly. I think, I think, um, conflict can be so small and petty and it can be so large and big and explosive. I think that when we look at conflict, it could be small, it could be large, but it could also be small and escalate very quickly. I think that when I read this verse, Ephesians chapter 4, it's powerful and it's encouraging to me because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we can be angry. That's encouraging to me. I'm just like, wow, we got permission to be angry. The Bible says we can be angry. Go ahead, be angry, but don't let anger control you. It says you can be angry, but don't sin within your anger. In other words, what is it saying? It's saying, listen, you can have anger, but you need to learn how to have the rules and the parameters within your anger so that your anger won't manipulate and control you. It's saying it's okay. And this is what happens with relationships. We have to understand that when it comes to relationships, it's okay to have conflict problem there there is no such thing as a relationship that doesn't have conflict there is no such thing it's inevitable for us to have conflict in the relate no matter how perfect you think you are and I'm telling you when I, I got married I thought I was I'm just saying no matter how perfect you think you are it is inevitable for you to have conflict in relationships what makes a relationship successful is not a relationship that doesn't have conflict what makes a relationship successful is the relationship that knows how to resolve conflict in a healthy, life-giving way. So God is calling us to resolve before we dissolve. Resolving before dissolving. And what I want to do is I want to share with us five key components um, on how to resolve our conflict. But the truth is that there are many things that bring conflict in our relationship. How many know that that's the truth? There are so many things that can bring conflict in our relationship. And I just want to give you three major things, according to the Bible, that bring conflict in relationships. And here's the first one. I'm going to be honest. The first one is expectations. Unmet expectations. 
unexpressed expectations and unreasonable expectations. See, some, re- some expectations have been expressed, but they're just not being met. And those things bring conflict in a relationship. Some expectations are just expected without expressing. You know, you ever, you ever, been, there, you ever been there like, I didn't know that that's what you wanted. Well, you should have known. Is that just me? Lisa and I, the other day, we are walking from a meeting. And, and my beautiful lady, she has her handbag in one hand. She got her laptop bag in the other hand, and she has a pizza box holding both. She's she's walking around like this. And I'm walking around with the keys of the car. And I'm just walking around, and I'm like, like, all right, in my mind, in my mind, I'm saying, all right, let me just get the door for her because she's scared of raccoons, and so I'm just going to get there. And in her mind, she's like, so I open open the gate of my house, and she goes, oh, you're going to go in first? And I'm like, yeah, what's what's the problem with you? you wanted to go in first? She's like, well, I just thought that you'd be a gentleman and you see me with all these bags and at least offer yourself to grab one. And I'm just thinking to myself, you could have just asked, you know? I thought I was being the hero. I was going to save her from the raccoon. I was going to go open the gate, or have the door open for her. Unexpressed expectations. Sometimes we have these unreasonable expectations. We have unreasonable expectations where sometimes we expect things from our partner that God didn't wire them to be that way. I remember expecting Lisa to be the most organized person. It's been nine years and every single time Lisa has gone food shopping, she has forgotten something when she got home. Nine years and I thought she wanted advice to fix her. And I realized that my baby girl just wants to live that way for the rest of her life is unreasonable. At nine years, I'm just like, now I'm just entertained. I forgot the soap. I forgot the adobo. And I'm just like, (laughs) I love you, baby. I love you. Unreasonable. So there's also number two, unhealthy and ineffective communications. Communication that brings conflict. There's expectations, but there's also unhealthy and ineffective ways to communicate that bring conflict. Unhealthy ways is is using a negative tone. So oftentimes we speak in a way that is very offensive. So many times we speak in a way that is ineffective. We're using passive uh, passive aggressive questions. We're using the wrong facial expressions. This is important for you to know, even as a parent, it's important for you to know that your children Listen, hear me. Your children learn tone before they ever learn words. And so many times we are trying to use the right words, but if we were just to adjust our tone, our communication will be much more effective. We're using the wrong tone. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the wrong level of expression when it comes to communication. And number three is self centeredness self centeredness and simply what brings conflict there is that you haven't learned how to get past yourself you haven't learned how to get past yourself I'm hot I'm cold and why is it that you can't see that I'm cold why is it that you can't see that I'm hot don't you understand It's our self-centeredness that the world revolves around our plight, our issue, our goals. And I want to be honest, I I think that no one here would ever say that we want the enemy to walk in and out of our relationship whenever he pleases. I think it's interesting because um, if we were to ask, would you go to sleep tonight with the door, front door of your house open? Every single person here has a lock on their door. Some of us have multiple locks. Some of us are, were raised in the hood, so you got like eight locks. We had like seven locks in my house back in the day. I'm telling you, it was no joke. Oh, and the kickstand on the bottom right there. If we were being honest, we would never go to sleep with the door wide open. But the Bible says that when we go to sleep, yesterday's anger and bring it over to today's anger 
to the present, the Bible says that it's, it's like we're going to sleep with the door open for the enemy to walk right in. It says don't give a foothold to the enemy. Don't go to sleep with your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath for it leaves a loophole or a foothold for the enemy to walk in and out. And I just think that God is calling his people to lead the way and be an example when it comes to relationships. That the way that we close the door on the enemy, sometimes we think it's just coming to church and singing and worshiping, but the way we close the door on the enemy in our marriage, the enemy is okay with you coming to church and singing and worshiping, but when you go home, you're in conflict. Why? Because he doesn't care as long as he got a space. Because as long as he got a space, has influence and we're thinking why is there so much conflict why are there so many issues why am I having so many fights here and it's because we have allowed yesterday's anger to continue into our today and we allow our anger from today to continue into our tomorrow we allow the enemy to walk in and walk out while we're asleep he's going to work God is calling us to commit I think the tools that we're going to receive today, these five tools, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend at least about five, five minutes on each tool, and I think it will transform our lives. As I was preparing this message, the Holy Spirit was telling me, you have to put this into practice. It's easy to share it. It's easy to speak it. But if we're going to resolve our conflict before we dissolve our relationship, we're going to have to learn how to fight fair. And here's the first thing I want to point out. Write this down in your notes. Number one, here's what you have to commit to. Because it's not just learning it. I don't want you to just learn it and receive it and just be like, oh, that was great, Pastor. Oh, awesome. I want you to commit to this. If you are in a relationship and you're saying, that, man, I need to learn how to resolve conflict. I don't want the enemy to have a loophole or a foothold in my marriage, in my relationship. And here's the first thing you got to commit to. First one is a good one. Ready? Commit to taking responsibility for what's your fault. Sometimes we're so focused on our plight and what they did that we failed to see the part that we took. Pastor Robert, you don't understand that they are the issue. They've caused the problem. I understand. But even if you're, if 99% of the problem is their fault, you're still responsible. See, because conflict takes two people. And so you're still responsible for the 1%. You're still re responsible for it. Even if it's 99% their fault. And everybody in the house says, that's right, it's 99% their fault. That's, I, I know what you're talking about. But even if it's 99% their fault, you take responsibility. See, you can't take responsibility for what they did, but you can take responsibility for what you did. How you reacted. How you responded. You can't lead, so, so if I'm going to resolve conflict, if I'm going to learn how to resolve conflict in a healthy way, then I have to learn by doing, by saying, I'm going to commit to taking responsibility for what's my fault. What does that mean? That means that I don't start with, look what you did. I don't start with, look at, how, look at all the ways that you hurt me. You don't start with, but you, but you, but you yelled at me. You don't start with that. What if we began conflict. Watch this. I, I want to say it this way. Before you begin confrontation, first begin with self-examination. Before you begin confrontation, begin with self-examination. What if you approach conflict by first considering the things that you are responsible for? And some of the questions that you can ask is, am I being realistic? Maybe I'm being too sensitive. Maybe I'm being too demanding. Maybe I'm being unreasonable. What I can first, the first thing I need to do is first examine what's on the inside world before I point the blame on the outside world. You are not responsible for the behaviors of your partner, but you are responsible for your behavior. Ephesians says in verse 21 it says that you put off concerning your former conduct and the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful 
lust. That, that, that word lust is, is what your desire is, what you want. I'm hot and I just want the fan. I'm cold and I just want the fan to die. James says, look where conflict starts. James chapter four, he says, what is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels? What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way and fulfill your own desires? I'm cold, I'm hot. The biggest conflict is not your partner. Your biggest source of conflict is not your partner. The biggest source of your conflict are your inner desires. And so we need to take some time and say, okay, if I'm gonna approach this conflict in a healthy way, I have to start with, hey, what am I responsible for? What am I responsible for? What if, and, and, and this is where we can take that self-examination, say, Lord, search my heart and check if there's any ill motive within me. Maybe you're watching online and you're saying, man, I've been struggling with, and I've been approaching this with blaming and pointing the finger. But what if instead of beginning with confrontation, we began with self-examination? What if we said that we are going to begin by asking the Holy Spirit, instead of blaming we're going to go to the name above all names and we're going to seek for his wisdom and allow him to show us where in our hearts we are dealing with this anger or desires that are not being met by our partner. I want to give you number two. Number two is commit to addressing the issue instead of attacking the person. Oh, this is a good one. Commit to addressing the issue instead of attacking the person. So many times we are so quick to demonize our spouse and make them out to be the enemy instead of addressing the issue. Have you ever been in an argument? I mean, you've spent, we've spent hours arguing. And have you ever noticed that you spent hours arguing and nothing got resolved? Like I've literally, like if I, if I, if I, <laughs> if I checked, it's a, it's a part-time job. In the five years, in the first five years of my marriage, we would spend hours arguing. Nothing would get resolved, but both of us would get hurt. Why? Because we were committed. We weren't committed to resolving the issue. We got distracted and saw ourselves as the enemy, so we attacked the person instead of addressing the issue. Have you ever noticed that when we demonize other people and we look at what they've done and then we ascribe motives to what they've done that we make ourselves the hero like you'll be like I went and I did the laundry I spent three hours doing the laundry and can you believe I came home and when I came home there were dishes in the sink this is hypothetical this is not between me and Lisa this is hypothetical and there were dishes in the sink and it's like let me tell you something like you tell your story like you're the hero i went to i did the laundry for three hours came home three bags on my back and i came home and there were two dishes in the sink it's like he dirties the dishes maliciously because he wants to see me just sweat and wash it's like he's paying me for making him freeze at night have you noticed that we could easily make ourselves the hero of the story and demonize our spouse? That's literally never happened when Lisa, Lisa never has said that. But it, how easy it could be that we demonize the other person. But Ephesians chapter 4, when, he, when you continue reading, it says, don't give the slanderous, the, the passion translation, it says, don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. Listen, you only have one enemy. I, I don't know if you've played basketball. If you've played basketball online, I've played basketball. And um, if two people go up for a rebound, everybody else on that team would look at the two people that are on the same team and shout two words. Same team! Hey, hey, hey! Same team! You know why? What's the message? The message is... 
hey, hold on a second. You two are fighting for this for the ball, but if anyone of you gets it, we are on the offensive now. So now we're winning. Hey, same team, can I tell you something? Anybody that's watching online, I think God sometimes is looking down at us from heaven and saying, hold on a second. Same team, same team, same team. There's only one enemy that God is calling us to conquer. For the Bible says our fight is not with flesh and bone. It is against the leaders and the powers and the spirits of darkness in the world. It's against the demons of this world that work in the heavens. Same team. What if instead of demonizing our spouse, instead of demonizing our partner, we said, you know what? We're on the same team. What if the next time you said that you were going to resolve a situation, you approached it, hey, honey, we're on the same team here. And if any one of us lose, we've both lost. I heard someone say, hey, I've lost many relationships, but I've never lost an argument. How many fights have we thought we've won? just ended up looking at our spouse as losers. We're losing in relationships. What if we said, hey, no, 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 no. we're going to come together. We're on the same team. And there's only one devil that is against us. And we're going to close the door on him right now. We're not going to give him an opportunity. We're not going to allow him to have his way in this relationship. This is how we fight our battles. We're going to pray. We're going to open his word. We're going to fast. We're going to seek God in this moment. But we're going to close the door on the enemy. If you believe that in this house, give God a shout of praise in this room. If you're watching online saying, this is how I fight my battles. Come on one enemy number two I want you to write number three I want you to write this down commit to listening without defending Ooh. is this hitting anybody is this <laughs> commit to listening without defending when we're in conflict we spent so much time focused on defending ourselves but if we're going to learn how to resolve conflict in a healthy way we have to learn how to watch this listen to their heart more than their words this is this is gonna be online this is gonna be on. I'm watching this on Sunday I'm just saying I had to learn how to do this I'm going to be honest, just being full disclosure, full transparency. I had to learn how to do this. Many times you have to learn how to bring out this relationship stethoscope and learn how to hear their heart more than their words. See, because so many times when there's conflict and there's tension, so many times words are being said. And many times the words that we're saying is just the best we can do to try to describe what we're feeling. And we don't even know what we're feeling many times. Many times we don't know if it's insecurity. We don't know if it's fear. We don't know if it's jealousy. We don't know what it is, but we're feeling it and we're trying to communicate it. But I want to let you know that, that we need to learn how to hear. Okay, what, is, what I know, I know, she's, I know she's, she's saying that, but what is it that she's really saying? I remember one time uh, Lisa texts me and she says, Honey, I feel disconnected. You know where my mind went, right? I got 10 reasons, and eight of them are your fault. That's where my, I'm just saying, that's where I didn't say that. That's where my mind went. But what could I do? Should I just listen to her words and now try to debate her words? Or should I, let me listen to what her heart is saying. Let me listen to what her heart is. And, and you got to bring out, you got to bring out the, the relationship stethoscope. I need to hear her heartbeat. And one of the few times that I got it right, in a moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, hear her heart. Don't defend yourself. Because when she said, when she said, I feel disconnected, I heard, hey, you've been distant from me. It's your fault. 
you should be making me the priority. She didn't say all that, but that's what I heard. But the Holy Spirit said, meet her heart. And I said, honey, you're right. We have been a little disconnected. Let's make our priority to get together tonight. Woo! That girl's heart was met. There was no fighting. Why? Because we got to learn how to listen without defending. If, this is why um, James says, remember this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and should not get angry easily. I don't know about you, but I'm quick to get angry. I'm quick to speak, and I'm very slow to listen. You ever, you ever been in an argument and you're just like, you're just ready to debate everything that da, 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 especially our analytical people. Can I tell you, our analytical people, I, I'm analytical. I think in, like, I'm, I'm dissecting everything you're saying and I'm showing you how you're wrong in every single way. Like, psh, nope, you don't make sense. You don't make sense here. Oh, you, you just disagreed with yourself right here. Nope, this doesn't. And instead of doing all that, instead of being an analyzer, what if you said, I'm just going to bring out the stethoscope. I'm just going to hear your heart. It says, be quick to listen. I'm so quick to speak. I'm so quick to get angry. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are slow to listen and quick to speak, you will always be quick to anger. But if you take a moment and you say, listen, I'm going to listen without defending and I'm gonna make it a priority to try to meet your heart. Listen, no matter how good of a communicator I am, if Lisa is defensive, she will completely compromise how she hears everything I have to say. No matter how much of a direct communicator that Lisa is, if I'm defensive, I'm always gonna filter out what she has to say to me. We have to learn, we have to li learn to listen without defending. Fourth one is we commit to speaking without offending. So we gotta learn how to listen without defending, but we also gotta learn how to speak without offending. And there's some words that we just learn, need to learn how to remove from our vocabulary. When we get into conflict, there are some words we need to just simply remove from our vocabulary. And if you're married, it needs to be the word divorce. There's some people you're not even married and you've already contemplated your divorce. Because if you, you know that there needs to be a plan B just in case this doesn't work out. So many failed relationships. How could it be that I'm going to be in a relationship forever? I've already had a failed relationship. I've already had a failed marriage. I'm quick to hit the exit button. And even before you are in a relationship, you've already thought about the divorce. And I'm telling you, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you're in a marriage right now, one of the things that you got to just remove from your vocabulary is this word divorce. So I've seen so many husbands threaten their wives with divorce. That's it. It's over for me. No, no, no. You need to learn how to not just fight in your marriage, but fight for your marriage. Come on, somebody. You need to learn how to not name call. Not call. That's, that's one of the ways you fight fair. Are you going to attack the person or are you going to address the problem? And if you are using, if you're name calling or oh, you're such a blah, 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 blah. Oh, you hypocrite. Lisa and I were like ridiculous. Like we mock ourselves. We mock each other. Oh, you worship leader. First five years. Go ahead, pastor. Go ahead, pastor. We didn't call our names, but we mocked our titles. <laughs> we got to learn how to fight fair. And we got to, there's certain things that we just got to remove from our vocabulary. But besides that, it's not always, most of the time we've, we've learned how to not say those things. But generally speaking, it's not what we say, it's how we say it. Your tone, your body language, your facial expressions. Do you know that someone could be made feel, someone can be made to feel disrespected simply by your look? 
You know that the Bible says that, that God hates in the Old Testament? The Bible says that God hates, listen to this, listen to it clearly. It says God hates a prideful look. It doesn't just say God hates pride. It says God hates a prideful look. If you even look like it, God is concerned with it. And so you'll learn in, in counseling, we've learned that even our body language communicates more than our words. And so many times we're like, we're, we're, we're trying to learn the right words and God is just saying, no, maybe if you put a little tenderness to your tone. I wonder what it would look like if we began to resolve conflict by listening without defending, but, but speaking without offending. How many of you know that you can hear someone and not understand their language, but you can understand their tone by the level of their tone? If someone comes speaking to you in a different language and they're like, like I don't know what they said, but I know I must have pissed them off. Right? Because you understand tone. You understand facial expressions. You understand body language. I want to tell you right now, how you say something may just be, write this down, how you say something may just be more important than what you are saying. How you say something may be more important than what you're saying. Why? Because if how you are saying it is not with tenderness, what you are saying is irrelevant. You know why? Because it's not being processed. It's not being received. It's not being accepted. You know what's happening? You're, I'm feeling. So if you come at me angry, my feelings are activated quicker than me hearing what you have to say. So, so if somebody comes out, here, here's a way is it, right? Here, here's a way of saying it. Can you say it this way? You know what? You embarrassed me. All right. Or you can say, honey, we had people over the other day. Those jokes you made, watch this. No blame, no blame. Watch this. Honey, I know it wasn't your intent. Ooh, baby. Man, I'm helping you out right here. I'm just giving you the 101. I know it wasn't your intent, but when you made those jokes, I felt. I'm taking response. I felt. I know that's not what you meant, but I felt embarrassed. See, it's different. The tone. Here, here's what the Bible talks about when it comes to our tone. Proverbs 15 says, a soft answer turns away wrath. But harsh words stir up anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6, it says, let your speech always be gracious. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15, it says, no, we will speak the truth in love. Well, I'm not soft, Pastor. Oh, it's, it's not, remember? Same team, it's not about you. I'm not so, I, Pastor Roy, I just tell it like it is. I just say what's on my mind. Well, that's called being rude. Our goal is not just to tell it like it is. Our goal is not just to say it, Frank. No, the Bible says to speak graciously. The Bible says to speak the truth. There's a lot of truth speakers. Well, I, I, I'm just going to tell you the truth. And why is it that every time somebody says, I'm going to tell you the truth, they always say it with an attitude. I'm just saying. Is that just me? I'm just going to say the truth. I just speak the truth. No, the Bible says to speak the truth. Here, here's the package. Here's the delivery. In love. In love. In other words, you need to serve it on the plate of love for it to be received effectively. What, what does it matter that you are serving the most amazing steak on a dirty plate? If you think about it, this is what distinguishes Christ Uncensored from so many different churches. We've come here and we're like, man, I just come to this church and I don't feel judged. You know why? Because we speak the truth, but we speak it wrapped in love. There's so many people, like you've seen them, right? Repent or burn. Okay, I get it. Or you can.
can say it as, hey, God wants you to turn to him and come back home because he wants to live with you in eternity. And he died for you so that he can restore relationship with you. You see the tenderness in the tone? Oftentimes it's not what we're saying, it's how we're saying it. And the moment you begin to yell, the moment you mean you begin to roll your eyes, the moment you begin to suck your teeth, the moment you begin to give your back, your body language communicates, I'm undermining you. I don't want to see you right now. You are irrelevant. And your body language communicates more than what you're worth. But I didn't say anything. Oh, you said a lot. You just didn't use your words. You got to listen without defending so that you can hear their heart. But you also got to learn how to speak without offending so that you can reach their heart. Number five, and we'll finish up right here, is commit to forgiving the person even if we agree to disagree. The truth is, I, I want to be honest, everybody watching online, the truth is that no matter how great your relationship is, no, how, no matter how much you guys desire to meet each other's needs and serve one another, we're going to miss the mark at times. We're going to drop the ball at times. Your wife is not perfect. Your husband's not perfect. Your boyfriend's not perfect. Your girlfriend's not. Your partner's not. They're not perfect. And even if they have the best intentions to meet, to meet your needs and to be there for one another, even if we have the best intentions, we will miss the mark. And sometimes we're setting up an impossible standard. And there's sometimes that there are fights that we shouldn't even have. What if you learn how to forgive even when you can't come to a resolution? What, what happens when you can't see eye to eye? What happens? You choose to forgive. You choose to forgive. Because forgiveness is what allows you to be in, forgiveness is what allows you to disagree without being disagreeable. Forgiveness is what allows you to disagree without being disagreeable. And there are some fights, I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever want to be in a healthy, life-giving relationship, there are some, relate, there are some fights, you have to choose your fights wisely. Some fights are not worth having. There are some fights. Let me tell you, every time Lisa comes home and forgets something on the list, especially if that thing on the list was my thing, ooh, I want to get in a fight. But I've learned, I'm not going to make a big deal out of everything. And so there are some fights that you just got to let go. And there are some fights that you will not see eye to eye and hear me. You just have to learn how to forgive even when you disagree, when you agree to disagree. Jesus sets the perfect example. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, as we go to verse 32, it says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving, watch this, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. As the worship team comes up, I want to close us in this last point. Jesus is telling us through the writings of the Apostle Paul, that we are to forgive how? The way Christ forgave you. Well, how did Christ forgive you? Well, Jesus, look how God forgives us. Jesus forgives us that while we were still sinners, the Bible says, that he came and died for us. That when we had the wrong attitude towards him, he chose that when we were disrespecting him, that we were blatantly sinning against him, when we turned our backs on him, when we rolled our eyes on at him, when we looked at him with disdain, when we were sinners, Jesus chose to forgive us. I don't know about you, but I've spent too much time trying to convince people of their wrongdoing. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, what if, oh God, what if what's going to change your wife, what if what's going to change your husband is not you pointing out how wrong they are, 
but you showing them grace that they don't deserve. They wronged you. They messed up. But what if what changes them is, is the grace, the way Christ forgave us? You remember the prodigal son? He, he comes home and he's like, look, look at all the wrong I've done. Look at all the sins I've committed. And the father's like, don't worry about that. And the Bible says that he falls upon his son and hugs him. You know what is going to change? You know what's going to create change? It's our ability to show grace. I've spent so many hours just pointing the finger and I, no, I want to show you how wrong you were. And then we preach the gospel and we say, oh, God doesn't hold your sins against them. But when we go to our spouse, oh, God, I'm going to hold her sins against me. And what if what brings change is not you showing them how wrong they were, but how much God has loved you. And because of that, you are able to show them grace, even though they don't deserve it. My God, my God, come on, give God a praise in this house. This is the ministry that God has given us. The Bible says that because you have, you have been reconciled with God, that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. In our relationship, sometimes God just wants you to extend grace to others. In fact, the Bible says this. Watch how powerful this. This rocked my world. The Bible says that if you go to the temple, Jesus saying, if you go to the temple, he says, leave your offering at the door. And go reconcile with your brother. Isn't that amazing that Jesus, no, 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 I'm going to church. <laughs> I'm going to church. Jesus says, no, it's more important for you to reconcile than for you to go to church and have an offense with your brother. He says, leave your offering at the door. Now, he doesn't say don't go to church. He just says, hey, go. It's more important that you be reconciled with your brother. It's more important that you be reconciled with your wife with your husband and for you to come to church and pretend like nothing is going on. Resolving before dissolving. I want to pray for you today. If you're listening to me online, I want to pray for you. Maybe your relationship right now is at a place where it is dissolving and God is saying, no, 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 no. You can close the door on the enemy. You can close the door on the enemy if you learn how to not just fight in a marriage, but fight for your marriage by fighting fair and resolving the conflict that is allowing the enemy a foothold. I want to pray for you. And maybe today you're saying, you know what? I don't know if I've been a good recipient of the forgiveness of God, and I need to do that today. I want to pray for you if you desire to place your faith in Jesus. If that's you, I want to pray for you. At the count of three, would you be willing to lift up your hand? One, today's your day. Two, Jesus loves you. Three, you can, you can spend eternity with him. Come on, lift up your hand. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And I first want to pray for the person that wants to place their faith in Jesus. And you don't have to say this prayer alone. Just say this with me. Say, dear God, I receive your love. Therefore, I give you my life. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and resurrecting on the third day. And from this day forth, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I wanna pray for your relationship and your marriage as we get ready to worship again and respond to God's grace in worship. I just wanna, just right there, where if you're tuning in, if you need this in your relationship, in your marriage, I want you to hold your, your partner's hand and you say, ah, I'm ready for fight to fight for us. Father God, I pray for every hand that's lifted up, oh God, right now. And I pray, Lord, will you become the center of their relationship, Lord? Now, we may know that we are not each other's enemy, but there is only one enemy, oh God, that we fight against, oh God. And we pray, Lord God, that we may learn how to fight our battles, oh God. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we may be able to forgive one another, extend grace to one another, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. That we will be able to listen to each other's heart, that we be able to speak with a tender tone, oh God. That we may be able to resolve the conflict instead of destroying the person, oh God. We may be able to take responsibility for what is our fault, oh God, and walk in humility. 
We thank you that you're, you're releasing healing right now. You're releasing healing.